Hello, this is Roger Lewis. Um, sorry about that, we've had a slight delay. I um, have just managed to change the stream name key. For some reason, um, the key for the stream had changed. So I've just gone in and changed that. So we're now live. Um, what I'm going to do is just uh, get the screen settings uh, back to what they need to be. Um, there we go, that's that. Then I am going to just give John a tinkle. Overridden the system, have you? Uh, well, I've, I've just basically put the. Yeah, it's talking to each other now where it wasn't before, so uh, there we are. Um, cool. Well, this records as we're going along anyway, so um, right. even if no one's tuning in, because they, you know, people get a chance to, to look at it another time. So I'm just going to put my glasses on. Uh, that's that's what you should have done the first time, put your glasses on. <laughs> um, and, right, here we go. Now, I have got here some questions. Which, uh, I'm just going to Do you want me to explain why this happened while you're deliberating? Um, wh why... We're having a well, conversation, or why we're late? Or well, no, no, oh, well, I think why we're late is old hat now, isn't it? No, no, just why um, you responded to the article that I had written, and why I wrote a thousand-word article explaining what my brilliant idea was, tongue-in-cheek, of course, because yeah. free market capitalism has been around for rather a long time, hasn't it? Uh, and I know that uh, the economists who will have responded to this will no doubt be uh, interventionist economists, people who will want to do things. I know Richard Werner will want to uh, disaggregate credit and direct all his uh, newly created credit into wonderfully productive investments uh, and manage it which, of course, you can do without managing. Steve Keen, well, he'll have his Minsky solution to uh, managing the economy and managing everybody, uh, whereas the simple solution, if you really want to sort things out, is to get government out of the equation and uh, build upon a system, the capitalist system, which uh, is the only system which has ever produced sustained growth. So if you go back through the 19th century, you'll see um, the Industrial Revolution. You know, a great time. I came across a professor of history recently who said uh, the Industrial Revolution was when the rich got rich and the poor got poor, which I had to correct and say, no, it was the period of time when the rich got rich and the poor rich as well. And then you come into this century, you can see it's like China. And, uh, and Russia, who try and ignore capitalism, and uh, you can see what a collapse that was. So what do we want? We want capitalism to work properly, and that means improving upon it all the time. So my concern was to just reintroduce us all to the, uh, the capitalist system. Right, OK. And so what you've just outlined there, John, is, is uh, this log that you did which was free market capitalism it's their future which has the spaceship well with a space shuttle with people. my four grandchildren that's your, I, I figured it was probably your grandchildren <laughs> um that's so, it so that was that that blog um and that cropped up then in a twitter discussion we were having um that's right and uh previously We'd had another discussion. You mentioned Richard Werner just, just in what you were just saying as by way of introduction just then. 
and um, you mentioned disaggregated credit and this is where I mean I mentioned his Forrest Gump theory of money comment at the end of your blog which I I, I think is uh, that, that that tickled me I thought that was quite funny um, yeah and um, uh, so if we look at your your blog which um, there's a well, the whole thing is, yeah, everything that I've sort of said in that 1,000 words is captured across my blog. But someone wanted me to put it all together uh, just in a nice brief statement of how the world could become a better place. Uh, so that's what I did. Uh, it uh, obviously needs further explanation. Yeah. Uh, but uh, all the elements are there and everything I say, I'm prepared to justify. Okay, okay and that, that, that's obviously now we're going to have our conversation on, on the screen as we're talking um, this yeah. is, uh, on the right hand side of the screen is you um, and then I'm in the top right hand corner and I yeah. be, because we were late starting off and all the rest of it I I haven't figured out how to put me in a, a you know a, a big picture by you which is which is fine um, but I will walk, I, what, what I plan to do John is to work through the list of questions and the introductory yep. thing. Um, so picking up on your introduction there, um, you mentioned a few words such as interventionist economist um, yep. and your thousand word, um, uh, what should we call it? Ask, it was an article, wasn't it? Someone asked you to put it yeah, all article together. Blog. Yeah, an article blog, yeah. whatever you like. Okay, so uh, your blog has got these lovely tiles and the nice pictures. I like you know, I, I like this layout. I use this layout in my blog too. Um, like I said, I think we, we think a lot alike, but we do have some differences of opinion, which, which obviously, we, you know, the, the beauty of this kind of format is we can just chat those through. So this is John's blog. In the description of the video, there'll be a link. There are links already in the, uh, in, you know, the preparation for this thing. And then this is the one the free market capitalists, it's their future. And then what 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 I did with that was um, I went through um, that blog and I, I highlighted out the main headings um, in the thousand words. Um, and then what I also did is put the thousand words into a word cloud, which comes up with the with the main uh, words that you use uh, and it, that's yep. quite a good way of it, the words come out of context but an interesting thing about that is that you mentioned the bank twice bank the word bank yep. is mentioned twice in a thousand words um, and uh, both in the context of a central bank um, right now that's, there's a very good reason for that and the, the very very good reason for that is that uh, they're not particularly important Money is not particularly important. Uh, what you just need is some central bank that can manage uh, a growth in monetary demand, which is steady and stable, shall we say, 5% a year. They can't do anything else. They can control inflation. That's about it. So they're not particularly important. They're a benign institution in some senses because they do no good, but they could do a lot of bad if they get the policy wrong. And one of the um, blogs uh, on there explains how the Bank of England has caused enormous problems uh, throughout the last century by making horrendous mistakes. Um, so I'm not a supporter uh, of the Bank of England, which is why it only appears twice. And uh, it's unimportant, but it is the only macroeconomic management tool left, if you read my article, because I remove fiscal policy. Uh, I would uh, quite happily have a fiscal policy uh, which is no fiscal policy governments balance their budgets and whenever they want to spend money they raise taxes keynesian demand management counter cyclical policies no evidence they ever work and theoretically i can explain why they don't work and we need to sort of then question silly theories like modern monetary theory which uh, wants governments to borrow money, spend money, because that's the only way that money gets into the economy, the only way that uh, we people will get enough money to pay taxes, 
etc etc all very silly uh, so i want limited government balanced budgets and a bank of england that just achieves an inflation target and nothing else right. uh, and you put those points all in your thousand foot a thousand word essay and um, yeah uh, and that begs a thousand questions if i may say i mean uh, because obviously um, in a thousand words you can't define your terms for instance so no. Um, you're a monetarist. That's that. You know, we talked about that earlier. You're John Hearn yep. monetarist, not Milton Friedman, yep. uh, Friedman yep. or uh, not uh, Hayek, not von uh, Hearn is monetarist. But you're John Hearn, and you are a monetarist, which is a broad school. I think is that yep. is that fair to say? Um, That's and, correct. And yes. As a monetarist, you are critical of the Keynesian school of economics, which again is a broad, a broad church, shall we say? Correct. Um, and um, if if I can just get your word cloud up um, yeah. for your tag crowd. And it's the it's showing now. It's the first one here, um, and it mentions the the thing it mentions most is government, but in yeah. the context of getting rid of it. Uh, That's so right. It, I mean, I've it, explained it, what it's got to be limited. Yeah. It, it doesn't mention um, it does mention money, so that's quite good, um, and that, that that obviously becomes then the question. Um, Central banks and governments, you know, we can do without those by your argument. Um, and then in terms of money or the amount of money in the economy, there's no explanation because you only mentioned banks twice in the context of central banks. Where does the other money come from is, is, is the question. Where, where... The money will, yeah, the money will be managed by, a cent oh, sorry, as it is at the moment, there are lots of different ways of supplying money to an economy. Uh, if you go back in history, but the current system is that the central bank manages monetary demand and it supplies 100% of currency, which turns out to be about 3 or 4% of uh, monetary demand. The rest of the monetary demand has been created over the years by uh, private banks issuing loans and double entry bookkeeping. Each time they issue a loan, uh, they create uh, a monetary credit and the money supply is made up mainly of bank loans, but it is controlled by the Bank of England. They take responsibility, and they can. They can control that uh, particularly well, and you know that because why on earth would they have taken a commitment to target 2% inflation if they can't control it? Now, they can control it, and they can hit that target. Well, that's a big question about, you know, what why one why there's inflation two why that target of the the target is two or three percent whichever it is and whether that is related to um the very fact of interest on money and the creation of money whereby principal is created um but not the interest which in a growing economy um isn't the end of the world in terms of because velocity and all the rest of it comes into the into the equation but when it's unwinding when it's going the other way whatever causes um things to go the other way madness of crowds call it what you will going the other way that, that, that then becomes a problem now you say what you said the money's created by private banks and over the years that makes up the money supply now um, money basis credit and debt um, relies on a constant fund of new loans because what happens when you pay a bank a bank loan off to the bank how is that treated in terms of the bank's accounting yeah it doesn't require um, a continuous stream of new credit and new loans it only requires things to happen at the margin 
So every day there'll be people paying off their loans and finishing a loan. And yes, that destroys money. And exactly the same time, there'll be other people taking out new loans. So the net effect at the end of the day would be no effect whatsoever on the money supply unless more loans were issued or less loans were issued. Now, you have a situation where the central bank monitoring this can actually boost the money supply as required, create liquidity in a system if there's shortages. And they don't do it very well. But, you know, the last 10 or 15 years, they've actually got the hang of things, but they've made one mistake. And the one mistake is to try and manage uh, the amount of credit in the economy by interest rates. And I, throughout everything I write, I explain that governments under no circumstances should ever get involved in influencing prices because they can't do it efficiently. The Bank of England certainly can't do it efficiently. And there's an alternative. The Bank of England can create a growth in monetary demand, the required growth, without touching interest rates at all. They can just be left alone in the marketplace to bring together all the people who want to borrow money and all the people who want to save money. Okay. Now, in terms of bank money created, so this is yep. private bank money, let's call it private bank money, credit at interest, yep. right? Um, how much of that money that they create goes into what we would call Main Street or the real economy. You know, in, in, in America, it's Main Street and Wall Street. And in the UK, we don't have a similar thing. But it's it's kind of like the real economy. And then there's this, the fi what I would call the financialized economy. Um, yeah. we, we've seen a huge increase in the money supply. But yeah. people at the cash tills, there's a problem. There's a problem at the cash register, and therefore that seems to be a misallocation of credit, I, I would argue. Yep. Exactly right. And the reason that there is that misallocation of credit is the use of interest rates to try and manage it. What you've done is you've created a situation with ZERP and ZERPish policies where the attraction for anyone who's an investor is not to invest in productive investments and invest in uh, new plant and machinery and new businesses, the real economy. Uh, you can make much more money just by flipping second-hand assets, which means that you cause speculative bubbles. There's a simple inverse relationship, something I can't get Richard Werner to, to agree with. He won't disagree with it, but I can't get him to agree with this. There's a simple inverse relationship between asset prices and interest rates. Put interest rates down low, asset prices go up. So if you're an investor, you watch interest rates going down, you buy into uh, assets, second-hand assets, they will go up in value. And then you, you're you told that this is just emergency. This is low rates for a short period of time. So you anticipate making yourself a little bit of money for a short period of time. And then it goes on and it goes on. So gradually, uh, people get more and more involved in purchasing second-hand assets the bubble develops and the low rates hold that bubble up to a point at which it will burst. And it doesn't actually have to have interest rates to go up for it to burst. But if interest rates do go up, it will burst. Uh, and that's the only way to solve the problem is to burst those bubbles. Right, OK. I mean, I, I'm asking questions um, about what I would say are imaginary concepts you see i i think money is something that exists in all of our imaginations it isn't yeah it, it's not real in the sense of being a real limited resource and so to that end okay. when we talk about oh well the banks can issue more money or monetary demand or you know um su supply side economics and what have you. Um. Yeah, no, it's only demand side economics that you talk about with money. And the fact is that you can do anything you like with money. You can create hyperinflation, you can destroy an economy, you can hit a 2% inflation target, you can hit 30%. You can do what you like. Can, can I just make a distinction here? And it's a distinction yep. which 
Carol Quigley makes in Tragedy and Hope, which I think is very helpful, yep. uh, when he points out that um, wealth and money are two different things. Wealth is something that you have, and money is yep. something which is a claim on wealth, so it's something you don't have. And that's where that's where Frederick Sorry Soddy's little rhyme comes in, is that, you know, money is the nothing you get for something before you can buy anything and so it's this this kind of um it's a token it's representative really what it is is a rain check when we're talking well, sim- about fiat money is, is right the simple thing simple thing there is that wealth is just totally different from money except for the fact that you measure wealth in money and you can hold your wealth in uh, assets which are very illiquid, you know, a house, uh, uh, properties of one sort or another, or you could hold your wealth in the form of money. So there is a demand to hold money, uh, and that's still your wealth because it has value. It has value because it can buy other things. It's not value in itself. So that fiat money has no value in use. It only has a value in exchange. So you can measure your wealth everything you own, including the money that you own. Okay, now, in terms of measuring with money, uh, yep. I mean, how good a measure is is, is money? Because there's lots of different types of it, and we've already mentioned inflation. Um, yep. And we've also mentioned that it's, it's issued by private banks largely 97 percent of the stuff and they tend to make their decisions about where to do their lending do you think it's fair to say they do that on a fairly on a fairly short term or a fairly narrow broad of uh, uh, of uh, things of interest apart from say their credit card operations which are at massive rates of interest so yeah, I mean, I, questions in one there. it is, and I have no problems with banks creating money in the sense that when banks create money, they've usually done their due diligence. They're not going to lend to people who are not going to pay back the money. Well, they do in America, but they don't over here. They're not going to lend to people who can't pay back the money. Uh, so when they lend, they're usually lending to someone who's going to do something real with that money. So all of the problems, I don't blame bankers, Uh, you know, bankers are just businesses and with due diligence, uh, they generally make profits because they do a good job when they are lending and accepting deposits. I blame the people who control the banks. So I do go back to the central bank. They're the people who are making all the mistakes. It's not, uh, you know, there is no conspiracy. We can get on to that. I mean, I, I, I... Not the conspiracy. I don't think there's a conspiracy either. I mean, I, I think that. Um, what do you make of say things like the LIB, London Interbank offer rate scandal, for instance, or the money laundering scandals, the the huge criminality yep, at the very top of quite a number of banks, like Lloyd's Bank at the moment. Um, that's right. Now, that's exactly what the central bank, through its regulatory policy, should be controlling. That's what you know. A central bank is there for. It's there for its monetary policy and its regulatory policy, and it's a failure in its regulations if it has allowed those things to happen and hasn't come down on them and changed. Well, it, in some sense, well, it has exposed these problems. Yeah, uh, uh, the Bank of England. I mean, I was a property developer, and I, uh, for a, for a short period of time, I was actually the largest. Com- I was personally the largest customer of Henry Ansbacker in the city of London. I mean, they're a small merchant yeah. bank, but I, I happened to be their largest company at one point in time in my life. And um, uh, their 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 regulations with the Bank of England dealing with a you know a large customer as I was then. Um, yeah, they, they they were took it very very seriously. It was a very serious thing. I, I used to bank with Coots as well, and, and it was the same. Uh, you know, they they're into relationship banking, um, and they they, yeah. they they take it very seriously too. Um, but you see, it's fine if you're in the one. You know, if you're kind of an elite main player or something. Like that. But it's it's 
the smaller, it's like as SMEs make up the vast part of the economy, yeah, yeah. Um, it's also true that smaller transactions, which add up to larger ones, um, actually make up the bulk of, um, or, or do they? Uh, it's a bit, they add up to something quite big. So things like slicing and dicing and packaging up mortgages in the subprime crisis, right, yep. was made by basically lumping together a whole bunch of stuff, labeling yep. them with top tier sort of AAA rated stuff, but most of yep. it was complete junk. Averaging that yep. out, getting the quants to look at it, and the quants are kind of saying, well, you know, probabilistically, based on this curve, everything's going to be all right. And of course, it all blew up. And it wasn't just in America. That happened in the UK too. The, the That's right. Now, what you're pointing out, sorry to interrupt, what you're pointing out there is the one area of banking that does need to be investigated and controlled, uh, which is now what we are talking about, and that's proprietary trading. And I'm quite happy uh, to, uh, I was not happy with the Vickers report separating retail banking from everything else. Lots of banking is very low uh, risk and no problem whatsoever. What I would do quite clearly is separate uh, proprietary trading from uh, normal banking business, which means not allowing uh, proprietary trading to take place using assets that are drawn from other parts of the, uh, uh, the bank, the conglomerate uh, that's providing those funds. So. There is a problem in banking. It isn't the fact they create money and it isn't the fact that they lend money to people and accept deposits. The problem in banking is proprietary trading. Uh, and that is one area where you're identifying a problem. I agree with you entirely. And it's something that we need to deal with. And it would be fairly easy to deal with in a regulatory sense in as much as you would not allow the institution to uh, proprietarily trade. You'd have to set them up as separate businesses risking their own funds and well, nobody proprietary else's. Proprietary trading and um, bundling of assets. Well, see that thing, if you like. Are, are, are not actually the same thing. Um, uh, the, 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 moving on from that point, though. Um, yep. What about asymmetry of risk and skin in the game? When yep. a bank makes a loan, okay, this is Richard Werner's point about banks are actually baileys and not mortgagors actually in the yep. li lending contract. Um, yep. And it's actually a very important point because banks issue credit against the credit of their borrower. So they're effectively offering a security um, to, on that borrower. And they actually then have a nominal amount of skin in the game. They, they have the potential of perhaps losing money on the loan, but actually yeah. they don't because the, the idea that um, the borrower has to offer security up to a certain amount, um, that tends to provide the security that's required to cover the bank's the bank's own risk. So, so the amount of capital that a bank actually has exposed on these transactions when it's issuing this credit put it in a position where it doesn't have the sort of moral in, uh, moral hazard or interest in husbanding the transaction that people expect when a bank has a fiduciary. If a bank has a fiduciary duty to look after funds deposited with it, which it then lends out, which is not what they do. That isn't, that's what people think they do, but it's not what they do. What they do is they are licensed through their banking license, the ability to create fiat money uh, on a kind of an agency basis for the central bank, okay? Um, and they effectively are very undercapitalized. I've looked at this. I mean, if you look at the um, the, the primary 
capital ratios of the large banks and compare it to their loan book, particularly, and then get into their derivative positions. Um, Baal, you know, the Basel or Baal um, capital ratio requirement, it, it's just so much toilet paper. It's nonsense. It, it, uh, um, so where do you stand, John, on, um, well, number one, full, um, full asset-backed lending. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's necessary, but I certainly think that um, the degree of moral hazard and skin in the game that, that banks have in the current shape of our financial system is problematical. And it does encourage reckless, reckless behaviour from them, regardless, one, of the toothless um, nature of, you know, you, through the whole 80s, we heard about light touch regulation. Then we had Blair, then we had Gordon Brown, who kind of turned it into this art form, you know, it's kind of light touch, it's kind of light touch regulation on the yacht of your favourite billionaire, you know, if you're, you're Peter Mandelson or some such. So th this is the this is the point about um, by by your model of the economy where private banks issue the money. One, where's their where's their skin in the game? And um, yes, Bertha. I'm sorry, mate. I'm busy. Where, where, where's their skin in the game? It, you know, I, should, should should they have more? How do you deal with that? If, 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 yeah, if, if we're going to do it your way, how can you set my mind at rest about that um, that, that, that problem, as I see it? Well, you've said, yeah, you've said lots of things, so it will be difficult to answer all of them uh, uh, and indeed remember what all the questions were. But banks are in a situation where they don't actually understand that they create money. I teach lots of bankers. Uh, and one of the questions I say is, uh, uh, do you create money? Do you make money? And they go, yes, all the time. And they'll explain to me how they make profits. They don't understand what money creation is. And you have to remember with money creation uh, that they are, they are only creating new money at the margin. That money's been there before. That money is used again and again and again. And new money only gets created at the margin. They're not creating new money. Will you explain to me money. what you mean by that? Because that, that doesn't make any sense to me. New money is only created at the margin. What, what do you mean? Right. Well, all that means is that if all, all bank loans today added up to a billion pounds and tomorrow there was a net increase in bank loans to uh, one and a half billion pounds, then the net creation of new money is half a, mil half a billion pounds, whichever number I said. Um, and from day to day, there is usually no money creation at all in a net sense. So going back to what I said to you earlier, if people come along and they're finishing their loans off today, other people are coming along and they're taking out new loans today, the net effect is the end of the day. At the end of the day, things will be not much different from the beginning of the day. And if at the end of the day more loans have been created than have been destroyed, you'll have a net increase in money creation. But there are limits on what banks can do. Uh, they're fairly well disciplined in what they do. And I have no problem with that area of banking. Okay. The area well, of banking. I mean, we, have yeah, we, we, we have a distinct disagreement on, on that point, we do. which we won't resolve. But perhaps when we go through some of the other you know, some of the other points to get through them, because we could talk about that one for weeks. Um, That's right, we better move on, haven't we? we yeah, we'd, we'd better move on. So, um, in your essay, if, if I get, get down to it, this... Um... Do you want to know what government should do in my economy, where I limit them? Um, well, I, I mean, I think if we get to the headings that we've got here, we, we can take those those points to time at time. I mean, I've put all the points down here. Um, yeah, I can't read them from here, but you pick them and give me one at a time and I'll answer them for you. Right. So, um, in your tag crowd, okay, the top five things that you mention are economy, economics and economists. You mentioned them 19 times. Government, yeah. you mentioned 12 times. You mentioned income. 
private and management okay Th those are your yep. top your top things and people go and can find those words and go and have a look at the context that they're mentioned in you mentioned yep. banks twice in the thing of the uh, uh, uh um thing. Th then then you make this statement um as we've removed fiscal policy from micro economic management of the economy the only macroeconomic requirement will be for the bank of england to maintain two percent inflation rate without manipulating interest rates this will require a quantity of money on ma uh, of, on money management on their behalf i think that's of money management on their behalf uh, and i've said yep. well how do we keep track of the components and uh, an economy isn't about money it's about resources really it's about people resources and capital and, 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 and yep. as you say money is a, a measure of wealth uh, and real wealth is basically capital land land and plant and machinery and buildings uh, resources yep. like so so that's like materials um like iron ore uh, timber from forestry uh you know widgets if you will um yep. then there's um labor so there's workers and, and all of these things now um i mean it doesn't yeah matter. you don't have to... you can have all the money in the world but like the old sea prophecy says you know when you've polluted all your water when you've chopped down all your forests and and, and you've got rid of all your topsoil only then will you realize you cannot eat your money uh, that, you know, and that of, of of all things kind of shows, you know, m money um, is. But you never, you never could eat your money, but you could always use your money to buy food. Um, but, 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 the whole but, thing. But but once all those things have gone, because you've created, uh, you do accept that the money supply has something like tripled in the last ten years or something ridiculous. I mean, it, it's gone up hugely. Not in people's pockets. No, the, the, money, the, the, no, the money, money supply hasn't. Currency has. So the amount of base money in the system has increased very rapidly. Mm. Um, the money supply has only increased at a level determined by what you look at with the rate of inflation. Well, so well, look no, at the rate no, of inflation. No, no, you know what's that, gone up. That, the rate of inflation, number one, doesn't reflect the experience of people in their shopping basket. And it, it's a manipulated measure. That's right. That's a different issue. Um, it's the best measure that we've got. And in all measures like that, you never bother to look well, at you, the you, measure itself. You look at the trend. Is it, is, it, is, it the best, is it the best possible me measure that we could have? Because I can think of lots of measures which would be really better than, say, the retail price index. I mean, it, um, well, the retail price index is the best. The CPI isn't. The consumer price index isn't very good as a measure. Well, of a bad bunch i mean it's manipulated yeah. it's politicized it's you know uh, it, it's uh, what's the word it, it, it's spun you know this in the age of spin um you know no 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 top is left un, 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 unspun or gone over yeah it's difficult to manipulate it uh, in a system that we're in because there's a a basket of products which are available to anyone to go out and measure and there'll be other organizations looking at things uh, there will be people taking bits out of the basket and so we look at that bit of the basket and it's actually gone up more than that bit of the basket ideally if you want to measure inflation you measure every price of every product that's exchanged every minute of every day you can't do that so what do you do you select and you select a, a number of things and make a measure it's imperfect um, and I, you know, I have no problem with that. Uh, just, just make sure that when the trend is that that's growing a little too fast, make sure you cut back on the rate at which you allow uh, your economy, your, your money to grow. When it's not growing fast enough, then you can expand it a little. Far. The Bank of England can do all that. The Bank of England can hit very close to a target. they should do this one particular thing um, yep. and it's their fault that 97 percent of the money that's been provided by these private banks um, is somehow their fault as well 
Um, no, it's yes. not a fault. It's not a fault. Mismanaging it is the fault. You know, the fact that there's 97% of money created by private banks over the years is just a historical point, if you like. They never knew they were doing it. It's just a fairly simple system which created sufficient money to ex to allow economies, real economies, to expand. You want monetary stability. You want prices to be stable, uh, and then you wouldn't you wouldn't have any bother. All the time, prices are volatile. That's when you have a problem. Well, I, I think that it's a mistake in logic to talk in terms of monetary stability and to um, talk about the economy as a monetary object. I, I think that's a mistake. And it will lead to um, to compounding errors simply because number one, money is a variable. You know, which measure it isn't a measure at all. Um, yeah. So that that's the the, the, the it, it's no good as a measure. Um, it, as a means of exchange, it's absolutely bloody brilliant. You know, money is great for, for that point of view. Um, but the measure side of things is, is what does one wish to measure in an economy? You don't need to measure the money. What you need to measure is the output of an economy in terms of the necessaries of life and the luxuries of life. And then we get into a whole bunch of discussions then of the difference between value and the difference between price. Yeah. Um, and the different we can bring this out, I think, quite helpfully, because I, I did like your definitions of small government should be clearly focused on buying the public good, supporting the merit good, and, uh, uh, um, and um, uh, well, taxing the dissenting yep. good. Um, yep. Now, can you unpack that for us? I mean, I, I did sort of get yep. the definitions and put them into a the blog explaining it. Um, yeah, um, chance then. Give a chance, and I'll do that because right. uh, there are certain things that government has to do because nobody else will do them, uh, and that is the public good. The public good is a very precise product. It's that product that we all want, and none of us are prepared to buy. It's called non-rival and non-excludable. So it would include things. The simple textbook example of that uh, is always street lighting. Um, no one will buy street lighting. They put lights outside uh, their own doors so they can see to let themselves in, but they won't put them out in the streets for everyone else's benefit. Now, law and order um, is exactly the same. You all want law and order. You're not prepared to pay for that. So that's the one reason that governments should tax you to take money away to provide the public good. And some economists will say, that's all. We, they shouldn't do anything else. No, I don't go that far because I do think there's a responsibility on government to deal with education, and to deal with health, the two merit goods as described by economists. So I want uh, some government involvement in the provision of education and health. And I'm quite happy to have a national health service with limited uh, um, targets, uh, an education system. I'm quite happy to have an education system which is a state education system. I know what the best state education system is and you can run those alongside um, private uh, health and private education. I have no problems with those things at all and no more. I don't want government to do any more than that uh, and that means shrinking government considerably saving enormous amounts of money which just get released to the private sector of the economy and financing government taxation could be very simple as i say in this piece you can scrap all taxes uh, you just uh, have uh, a vat an excise duty that you can add on where you wish to um, penalize demerit goods so you want sweets and chocolates to be more expensive and you want alcohol to be more expensive and you can deal with the demerit good in that way and you can raise all of your up. Never tax wealth. Taxing wealth is a, is a waste and wealth is actually unimportant. What's important always is income and income is the thing that you tax. Yeah. Hold on, uh, hold on. And did, I suggest, did you just say yeah. wealth, wealth is unimportant and what's important is income? Yeah. 
Yeah. You want me to expand upon that? I think you need to make blazing. Have you fallen off your chair? Bradford, that is very busy. I'm live streaming. You hold on a second when I just go and have a look at what happened. I'll entertain people while you've gone, shall I? Because uh, Roger wanted to know the difference between income and wealth. And the reason that wealth is not particularly important is that there, there would always be an uneven distribution of wealth. Your living standards depend upon your income. And what the capitalist system, which actually increases equality of income, not inequality of income, the very opposite of it doesn't intend to do that, it just does it. So if you want to become equal over time, you deal with people's income. That, that's an interesting um, hypothesis, if you like. Uh, but yep. the empirical data tends to actually does show that that's not what's been happening certainly since the mid-1970s, where labor's share of income has, has fallen. It's stagnated at best and fallen mostly in real terms. Um, and the share to the firm sector, particularly the very top of it, um, it uh, 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 has, 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 has gone up to a level which is actually beyond where it was during the Roaring Twenties, the, the Gilded Age. Um, watch, and, watch. Now that's, uh, as far as last time I looked, um, we, that we've, we've had a capitalist system and we've had um, the system which came in under uh, President Reagan and Prime Minister Thatcher um, in, in the late 1970s and early 1990s. And nothing's changed since then. Those policies, okay, which I know you've criticised Margaret Thatcher, saying that you know some monetarism would be nice. We were talking about that earlier, um, and, and uh, um, you know we distinguished you from Hayek, uh, from Friedman, um, and I mentioned Dr. Alan Waters, who was the. You said he was a political economist. He was, you know politically monetarist. monetarist rather than the sort of pure, you know, the purity of, of Dr. Dr. Friedman and Professor Hayek or whatever. I mean, uh, I, I mean, forgive me having a little chuckle about that one because I, I, I mean, I, I think that economics at a national economy level and certainly more so even at a geopolitical level so international economics and institutional economics, there's lots of different types of economics, as you know. Um, and it, it can't be economics if it isn't political. I mean, even if a government isn't interfering, it's still, there's, you know, there is still political. And in this system, I wanted to ask you, democracy isn't mentioned in your 1,000 words, it's fair enough. Um, but democracy, um, are, are, are workers just consumers on the other side of the production function? Is, is that all they are or is there something more? I, I know, you know, you, you, you believe that leisure, as I do, is really important and it's, it's a much bigger part of, of life than, the, you know, i.e. live, work to live, not live to yep. work. Um, and balance and things like that um, but your economic model you know ha, ha, is maybe it's a merit good and you put it into your merit good budget as it were um, but the, you know the mar does the market uh, we've got demerit goods and we're allowing the government to do that you know what about the arts what about, what about the starving poets you know here's me sat here starving poet <laughs> You know, what, 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 you know, where, where does, you know, oh. where, where do I fit in? Am, am I a useless eater? <laughs> what you have to look at here is, um, 
I suppose 1970 you mentioned is quite a good uh, good year to start with because things started to fall apart uh, in the early 70s and when you looked at uh, limited government uh, it becomes more and more interventionist there is more and more intervention my model is concerned with creating economic growth economic growth is the only thing that will make us all better off and make us uh, appreciate the arts and be prepared to pay uh, high prices for uh, uh, poetry readings, uh, etc. So when you have more and more government, you have less and less economic growth. And less and less economic growth then reverses the general trend which is creating more equality and causes people to start fighting for a limited amount of resources. And the real inequalities that have occurred have been probably over the last 15 years, uh, certainly over the last decade, because ZERP has created a great imbalance. It gave opportunities to lots of people to earn lots of money when they had advantageous information, uh, when they were proprietary trading, when they were dealing in derivatives markets. Uh, um, they could become very rich very quickly, and that has made uh, the inequalities increase again. What I would have is a return to capitalism, which will start the trend going back to more equality. And capitalism, have no doubt, creates more equality of income. As I say, I'm not bothered about wealth. Uh, I, you know, I couldn't care less. You couldn't care less how rich people are. Uh, and in many instances, it's quite a headache. It's a headache. Rich, isn't it? Well, I, I, I have been. Well, was I fortunate? I, I, I mean, I, I was. I once was extremely wealthy. I mean, that you know, I was. I pretty much. I, I, at one stage in my life, I didn't know many people that were richer than I was. But you know, in, in those financial, you know, material terms. Did you? Yeah, so, did you become rich? Did you become rich by doing very capitalist things? Did you run businesses and did you uh, provide no, customers I, I, with... I, I, I proudly declare I was a useful idiot for capitalism and a useful idiot for, for finance capitalism. So, so basically, I was a useful idiot for... for I, I was a merchant of debt, in effect. You know, I was in the yeah, were you doing business, a good you know? job, though? Were you doing a job that people wanted? Were you selling customers well, something? I, I, this, well, this is, this is an interesting question because I, I was a property developer that did, I enjoyed building things, so I did build a number of buildings. But I made way, right, way so more money. On, I, I made more money flipping assets. And, and yeah. that's the point. Most people do. That's monetary mismanagement allowed you to do that, you see. Well, I, I accept that. Um, and I mean, I've returned my wealth, as Epictetus would have it. I mean, I, as it happens, I think it was confiscated by, you know, basically the government to bail out the criminal bankers who basically, um, you know, made a lot of really bad decisions and ha basically um, took the money out of my back pocket to make up for their thing. Because it, it's the real stuff, the real... Um, well, the taxpayer bailed out the banks, well, yes. Well, wealth matters because um, the, the banks make a lot of money repossessing things. They, they, they absolutely do. And historically, they have done too. I mean, there's a famous memo from about 1878, uh, just before one of the great crashes... Um, which caused a lot of problems for Midwestern farmers in the States. There's, there's a huge amount of uh, uh, congressional material on, on, on that event. And these are the events that led up to the formation of the Fed come 1913. So things like the crime of 1873 or whatever, the demonetization of silver. Um, I mean, monetary history and the manipulation of the monetary specie if you like or the money the, the means of exchange and control of that has been the history of political economy in terms of the uh, dynamic between industrialists entrepreneurs and financiers and the story of gold and silver kind of tells that but also um, 
post post um, the Nixon shot. And so when you say oh, all went pear shaped then because it became more interventionist, I would argue, is it more information? Was it that there was more um, more uh, intervention, or has it been the ability for bankers to, you know, produce this ninety-seven percent of money, which you know, I mean, in our Twitter feed the other day, Ricky. Um, Newing posted the thing about you know the famous uh, Rothschild quote about you know um, give me control of the currency and I don't care who makes the laws uh, you know and it, it you know, goes on like a flick of a pen you know and all this sort of thing well, well that is actually right if you think about it and, and so when you say you know the money supply um, has, has, has gone up in terms of bank balance sheets central bank balance sheets why is that important it hasn't allowed entrepreneurs or SMEs to increase their businesses. They've, they've been continued to be robbed by banks like Lloyd's. But what's happened is what used to be merchant banks have morphed into hedge funds. The hedge funds pretend that they're old family money and they somehow, from the sweat of their brow, ended up with these billions and billions of pounds. It's all off balance sheet debt, off the balance sheets of the big banks, and this is the problem. Most of the money is created by five huge multinational banks. There aren't small banks doing this. One with skin in the game and two that have to look in the eye people they know and, and, and socialise with people that they're actually robbing. So that's the skin in the game and the asymmetric moral ha hazard a aspect of that private banking. Now, it can be different. It could work the other way if 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 the people running these things had an ounce of ethics. Um, and so, um, in terms of big government, you talk about big government and central banks, but you don't mention how very large combinations um, and capitalism's tendency to monopoly under finance capitalism. You you don't go there. But that's where we've been going. I mean, no one told, no one sent me the memo saying that we're not currently living un under a capitalist system. I mean, you know, if you criticise the current system, you're considered to be co to criticise capitalism. I mean, if you say you're anti-capitalism, um, that's slightly more problematical because there are, uh, uh, um, if you look in the history of capitalism, there's something like thirty different species of it outlined. So, you know, I. Not many people yeah. would say I'm for mercantilism, which is basically a, a, a very sort of aggressive form of state monopoly capitalism. Um, and what we have at the moment, John, I think, I think we have fascism. I think we have got state monopoly capitalism. But that takes two to tango. It's not just the central banks and the bent politicians. It's also the, the corrupt bankers. And it's all the same thing, including the big uh -huh. private banks. I've written them down this time, so I don't miss all of uh, the points that uh, you're making. So there are three things to say here. One is there's a rough rule of thumb that anyone who gets their hands on a printing press, whether it's a monarch, whether it's a government, whether it's a central bank, will mismanage it. And they'll mismanage it because there are considerable advantages to them of mismanaging it. So... Um, all of the problems that we do face, uh, I go right back, it's the central bank that has done it. The idea of um, criticising capitalism for all of the problems that we have is actually more and more government intervention creates more and more mistakes. More and more mistakes are then blamed on something that isn't government. So it's capitalism, that does, so we need more government. So there are more problems. So we need more government. So the problems are created by government. That's why I want to limit government. The problems are not created by capitalism. What, what capitalism about, what about, is imperfect. What about limiting the size of corporations? So, yeah, know, I'm quite happy. Aren't they so just, aren't that's they third just a private kind of government? That's the third question uh, where you mentioned monopoly. I'm all for rules and regulations to keep markets competitive, make sure that there are lots of players. And if it's natural 
that something because of significant economies of scale is going to become a very, very large player in an industry, and shall we say the only player in the industry, then the public good is for government to offset their power. And I suppose the off word illustrates where you've got a large organisation, you can have off rail, you can have off what, you can have, well, education off stead, but we try not to talk about them. You can have off things actually trying to balance the power. Now, you know, and I know they don't do a very good job, but they could if governments concentrated their attention on doing the things that they can do, not interfering everywhere in the economy. Well, let's talk about your tax um, uh, yep. thing then. Uh, My reverse income tax. Um, I, I mean, I, I, the numbers, I think... Uh, were pulled out of a hat. Yeah, they are pulled out of a hat. and uh, um, I don't really want to talk about about those. Um, what I'm interested in is um, you suggest that a reverse income tax, which will provide a, a dividend, which is a, a guaranteed basic income, um, yep. and uh, you know that, that now. Ricky wanted to discuss the single land tax and, and the Georgius idea. Yep. Now, yep. bringing that up to date, when we're talking about large combinations and monopolists, um, you, you'll know as well as I do, in the 1950s, there was a lot of antitrust regulations in the states and they broke up a lot of big yep. monopolies. And... Yep. Um, that isn't what caused the problems for the American economy in the 70s and, you know, 70s and 80s. Um, Correct. In fact, that is the golden age of American capitalism. It, you know, by, by many... Well, the golden age, I think... Yeah, we're going to go back uh, probably to uh, the century before last for the golden age of capitalism. It's got worse and worse with more and more intervention. Oh, you're, you're, um, you're talking about the... Uh, are you talking about the, you're talking about the Victorian period as, yeah. as a golden age of capitalism? Yeah. With little government intervention, so things well, 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 grew very well, fast, well, economies grew yeah. fast, well, poor people became well, richer and so on. Well, that's... Uh, I mean, my, I come from a mining background, okay? I mean, yeah. And... Uh, my my grandparents were born around the uh, beginning of the 20th century, so late 18th, late, late 19th, early so, so, so uh, like my grandmother was born in the 1900s, right? Yeah. No, that's my mum's mum. But they were all born around that time. My four grandparents, and my two grandfathers were were miners, and they're before them mine. Now, to say that miners in South Wales were less poor than they would have been under an agrarian system you know and the yeah. story of people coming off the land and going into factories this is the dark satanic mills this is this is uh this is jerusalem this is blake and the dark satanic mills is isn't a metaphor for you know um uh the devil sort of being against jesus or something that's a metaphor yeah. of the, the the horrors of of, 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 of laissez-faire capitalism, and you're calling it a golden age. Exactly. Yes, but it's not. The horror is looking back to periods like that. If you looked oh, well, from you said, where people came from, was absolutely appalling. You know, I, I, it, was it higher? Yeah. So did infant mortality get worse and worse during that century or did yeah. it get better and better? It, depends it got which, better and better. No, it depends which communities you look in. And things only really began to um, improve when, um, when, when national health insurance stamps came in, which was something Lloyd George, um, the first liberal uh, Welsh prime minister, introduced when he was Chancellor of Exeter. And that, that, that wasn't until the 1918s, 1920s. And, and, and As you can see, I'm a, great, I'm a great fan of the National Health Service, so um, I'm okay with that. The reason that uh, 
the 20th century wasn't such a, uh, a good period for capitalism. I think it was two world wars that rather uh, sort of knocked out that century. There were only little wars uh, in the previous century. But the mistake that we all make is looking back to the 19th century and going, weren't things terrible? Wait a minute. Government. A limited government. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have. Do central banks finance wars? No, of course they don't. Governments finance it by printing money directly themselves. They print currency. But that's, that's not how... Um, I, I, if you look, look at the First World War, you look at the First World War, you go, you go to war, what do you do? You print money. You print money, you have to suspend the gold standard. You print money, you draw resources towards yourself. And then after the war, the Bank of England goes... Well, we printed rather a lot of money there. We better destroy loads of it, forgetting, of course, that all prices have all gone up. Now they've all got to go down. So you had a decade of deflation caused by the central bank. I think you've got the narrative from the mainstream textbooks there, but but I don't think you've got the the narrative there from the serious academic um, study into these things now. Actually, one of the papers... Oh, my my studies have been serious on this. No, well, uh, no, <laughs> no, 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 There are a number of factual inaccuracies in what you just said. Now, I know that you believe them to be true. One at a time. But, yeah, go on, one at a time. Give me the factual inaccuracies. Well, there's a paper which I linked to um, in uh, the blog the other day, which will be turned on. Let me just find it for you, and I'll tell you now. It's actually... Um, called the long cycle um and uh the no hold on um long cycle see one of the things with capitalism is to blame the uh, uh business cycle the trade cycle cyclical events on capitalism which is wrong capitalism so doesn't this, cause this, this is, um, monetary mismanagement this, does this is the historical cycle which has been documented um, oh. not, 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 it's not a, something like the hog cycle or some sort of, uh, where are we now? Anyway, someone that analysed the state of the public finances before wars and afterwards. I'll find it and put it in afterwards rather than sort of take it time yeah. now. Um, yeah. but, but, but what it actually shows is that obviously after each war, the, the public debt or, you know, the national debt has yeah. gone up. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's a bad thing. I mean, um, it used to be called shit money. And this is what Edmund Burke says in his essay, um, yeah. uh, These Present Discontents. He says, you know, that, 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 that under a tyranny and all the rest of it, when they want to rise, raise money for war, they don't go saying, here's another tax, then it's, you know, shit money again, because people get annoyed about that. But I, mean, I have explained all of this. I have explained all of this on the blog because the easiest way to raise money for a war is just to print it. So what you have in 1914 or 13, 12 is a, a lot of printing, a lot of inflation. Okay. Then after the war, the central bank under Montague Norman, uh, the Cunliffe Committee, made a decision to destroy the currency to try and take us back to the previous average level of prices. That created the problem. Second World War, exactly the same. Exactly the same.